Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stefan Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And today is time for another female first, which means we are so happy to be joined by the fabulous, the fantastic Eves. Welcome, Yay. Eve. Thank you. Glad to be here again. Yes. We're so happy to have you. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm pretty sure this same date last year, uh-huh. we recorded an episode and I was wearing the same sweater. Because <laughs> it's life day. But anyway, <laughs> I've been oh thinking about the passage of time lately and uh-huh. how strange it feels. Because I'm pretty sure I was, it was the yeah. same time you last have, year. You have really good memory. Oh, she has a lot of traditions. Too, <laughs> as a reminder in general. So traditions, like she does have a really good memory because she does remember stuff like this anyway. But it also helps that this is Life Day and this is what she does every year on Life Day, no matter what. <laughs> I'm just pretty sure I remember explaining it to you last year because you were like, "Is this a what sweater is this?" Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm excited to have you back <laughs> <laughs> on Life Day. On the life. Oh. A very fortuitous life day indeed. I'm excited because last time you were on, we were talking, you've been on with your friend and co-host Katie Mm -hmm. uh, from the podcast on theme. And you sent Samantha and I these beautiful cards, like thank you cards. And they were so exciting to get. (laughs) I can't tell you how I was like, oh, this is so cool. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. It's on my refrigerator. Oh, yes. Nice. Yes. No, so much appreciated. And we're probably going to rehash some of the stuff we were talking about off mic, but uh, we were talking about uh, sending uh, thank you cards and the kind of how nice it is when you actually get a physical, something in the mail that isn't junk mail or isn't something to make you <laughs> or sad. <a> bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I feel like I sound so old. <laughs> oh, those bills. Embrace it. In. Embrace it. <laughs> that starts early, honestly. It's not even an old thing. I mean, the life mm-hmm. with the bills thing starts happening pretty quickly. Right. <laughs> this is true. This is true. And you were talking about having a pen pal and all of that stuff and having a friend that you did that with. But can you can you talk about that a bit more? Your, yeah. your kind of thoughts, experience around the written? Yeah, I really like having a pen pal. And there's something about the like, because this was a person that I talked to semi-regularly. So it's like saving the things that you know are big to not tell them in like a text or a phone conversation and then wait, wait to hold it in the letter. So it's like this kind of suspense building or just like there's something to me being able to access my friends all the time. I can tell them things whenever I want to. I can text them. I can send an emergency alert in a second if I need them (laughs) in any moment. So I'm so used to just being like, if I need to vent to them, if I really want to tell them something juicy that just happened, like I can do that right on the spot. Mm -hmm. So I feel like with closer friends, there's something to having them be your pen pals and holding back on that immediate conversation and the gratification that comes with that. And then when it's strangers, there's something nice when it comes to divulging parts of your personal life to somebody who you don't really know who's far away and those things are contained in a piece of paper. So it feels more intimate because you can't just, it's not a text message. It doesn't feel like, you know, the feds are watching or, you know, they can immediately send it to somebody else. It's like, it's just in this letter and I need to wait for however long it takes them. And I don't know how long it's going to take them because I don't even have their number for them to like send me a letter back. And when I get it, it's going to be like a Christmas present in the mail. It really, you know, that reminds me because I don't know, did y'all all have the children's program in school where you had a pen pal, whether it's from the state or from a different country? I can't remember. I think my mine was from the States. But like not knowing when your next letter was coming in and when it yeah. did, it was the best thing. And you mm-hmm. had to take a moment to like run into your <laughs> spot to read and open that letter and hope it's more than just a page. Mm-hmm. That's what my, that's, I remember that moment now that you like talk about that. I'm like, oh, yeah, because you never knew when it was mm-hmm. coming. It, and it was very sad when it stopped. But it was very nice <laughs> when you did get them. And it was a long letter talking about their life. And it was so different. And you're like, wow. Mm-hmm. And they were from Indiana. <laughs> did you immediately write back? Or did you wait a minute to write back to them? I think I started. I think I would always start the letter. 
and mm. then like go on and do something else, whether it's because someone was yelling at me or I had to do chores or leaving or homework. Uh, but then I would come back and then finish it out and hopefully it would tell them different parts. Like one of my favorite books is Pride and Prejudice, as well as uh, several others. But, you know, in the book, there's a section where they're writing letters to each other. Obviously, that's all they do. But one of them is her talking about, you know, oh, this is happening this day. And then it pauses and there's like a different type of handwriting. Her handwriting is rushing to talk about the emergency they just had. Mm -hmm. And you know that this has been like a couple of hours wait. And when you see that difference, when you know that that obviously took a break <laughs> from writing right. because they're talking about something else yeah. out of nowhere, that was always fun to try to dissect. Oh, they must have, this must have happened during this moment type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And it was all mm -hmm. in the same letter. It was always exciting. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of like you were able to read into the gaps that yeah. were in the letters. Oh, mm -hmm. you're so close. That just on the paper, <laughs> you knew what was going on. <laughs> I think that is a pretty big trope in like, the things I have seen of rom-coms of, like, the letters yeah. exchanged, not knowing who it is, maybe, uh, falling in love. <laughs> there was that moment of, like, if it's a guy, maybe that's going to be my new boyfriend. <laughs> As a kid, thinking that. Oh, it was yes. never a guy. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> that's how sad I was. Yes, thank you. Oh. <laughs> no, I, because I had a pen pal, I think he was from South America somewhere. Uh, his name is Raul. And I had a moment, like, in third grade that me and Raul were going to, you know, meet. <laughs> Something amazing would happen. Aww. We'd fall in love. But I was also thinking, too, my one of my best friends, who's still one of my best friends, we were neighbors growing up. And I we would write, like, five-page letters to each other, I think every Friday. And then we'd put, like, stickers on them and, like, those mm -hmm. little jewel things. And we would put them in each other's mailbox. And then you'd go and get the letter that they'd <laughs> written. Cute. Even though we saw each other, like, every day. That's but so it would cute. just be, like... <laughs> That's cute. I like it. Mm -hmm. It was really cute. It was so, like, I was excited about it. It was a fun thing that we did. Um, so I, I'm glad. Uh, I, I agree. It's really fun, exciting surprise to get something like this, so we both really appreciated it. <laughs> I'm glad. How has the podcast been going? How is it? It's going really well. We're a couple of months into On Theme now, and we've talked about a lot of things that we've had fun talking about, and we're really excited about to talk about so far, you know. We've been able to talk about horror and magicians and uh, the ways we feel like we're missing out when we're watching things on television versus how we experience them in real life. We've talked about regret that different Black storytellers have had about their work when it comes to the things that they're working on that are related to race and a bunch of things. So it's going really well. I'm feeling good about the way we're going to close out this year with On Theme. With Ooh. Brandy yeah. and Cinderella. <laughs> Oh, yes, Cinderella. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I was thinking about this yesterday because I knew you were coming on this show, and I was like, "Oh yeah, my Roman Empire." I do think about this movie every day now. We have to do it. We have to do it. It's a classic oh. movie, mm. and I just it's, just, it's just, it's just, it's a request. It's mm -hmm. just, it's a friendly request. It's just a friendly well, request. Well, now that people know about it, we have to hold ourselves accountable. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Well, I'm excited for that episode, and yeah. I'm excited for uh, how how this year will close out. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, who did you bring for us to talk about today, Eve? So today we're going to talk about Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart. So we have talked about some women who are in the medical field a few times on the show. And Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart was the first Black woman physician in New York. But she was the third in the country. And so the two who were before her were Rebecca Lee Crumpler and the other woman was Rebecca J. Cole. So we've talked about in the past Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, who was the first Black female physician in the U.S. We never did an episode on Dr. Rebecca J. Cole, but everyone who's listening can go back and listen to the episode about Rebecca Lee Crumpler because that'll give you know, a good amount of context on that first and about all of the context around it, how difficult it was for women 
who were getting into medicine at the time, how oftentimes the men that were in their life, like their fathers or their husbands, were the ones who had to kind of help them get the inroads into being able to be in the field. In general, how some uh, white women who were already invested in medical fields were able to provide spaces where more women could come into their institutions that they created to get their own medical degrees. And then over time, that ended up being something that Black women had some access to, although it was still, even in the doctor we're talking about today, her time, difficult to get access to these institutions and the resources to be able to even go to them and afford them. But things slowly changed over time once white women first started being having access to be able to participate in medical fields and then were able to open institutions that could open it up to more women. But it was still dependent upon what their own politics were <laughs> for who they let into these institutions. So we are in that realm today and talking about Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart. But of course, every woman that we talk about on the show is important in her own right, has her own story. And that story comes within the line of so many other people before her. So just always important to acknowledge people like Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler and Rebecca J. Cole, who did similar things before the doctor we're talking about today came along. Right. Absolutely. And I love how so many of these stories in one way or the other that you bring, Eves, these histories intersect with each other, or influenced each other. So shall we get into the history here? Yep. So we'll start at the beginning when she was born in March of 1847 in Brooklyn, New York, in the Weeksville neighborhood. So she was the seventh of 10 children born to Anne and Sylvanus Smith. Her father was Black and her mother was mixed of Native American and French heritage. And they were pork farmers and they did well for themselves. The farm was located on what is now Fulton Street and Buffalo Avenue. And her family was pretty well to do. They were well accomplished and they were well resourced. Her sisters and her parents really focused on education for their children as well. Her sisters were a public school principal, a teacher, a piano player, and a hairstylist. Those were some of the occupations that her siblings had. And when she was young, she learned to play the organ. And apparently, the people who taught her to play the organ were really well-known and well-respected organists in New York. So she had a good education when it came to that. And that was shown in that she later became choir director and organist for her church in Brooklyn. and. It's a, there's not a ton of information on her early life, her childhood, her upbringing, besides the fact that her parents are well-to-do. They had this farm and her, her and her siblings were well-educated. So it's not really a ton known on why she even chose to go into the medical field. If the person that we're talking about themselves haven't said anything about why they chose to go into that field, what their impetus was for further pursuing whatever career we're talking about, or if there aren't any living people, descendants left from that person and what they have to say about it, it's oftentimes a lot of surmising about why they chose to get into the field. It suggested that she may have chosen to go into the medical profession because two of her brothers died during the Civil War and because she witnessed a cholera outbreak that hit New York City in 1866 but based on the sources that I've seen, this seems to kind of be an educated guess based on just the known experiences in her life. And she doesn't ever seem to have documented herself saying, I chose to go into the medical field because of the tragedies that I've seen in my life and how medicine helped them. But, you know, she was probably exposed to a lot of things based on the way that her parents educated her and her siblings and through whatever research or whatever way she was exposed to the medical field, she might have gained her interest in it that way because her parents weren't in the medical field either. But anyway, of course, like we said, Black women face barriers to entry in medical training and some of those things that we saw come up previously in Dr. Rebecca Crumpler's story, we see come up in hers. It was difficult for Black women to get entry into medical training in post-grad education, into white male-led medical institutions, 
into medical associations, which a lot of them didn't accept women at all and things like that. And once they stepped into those doors, they were excluded in more ways and faced interpersonal acts of discrimination. But Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart still went in this direction. And the New York Medical College for Women opened in November of 1863. It was founded by Clement Sophia Harnett Lozier. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. A wealthy white woman who was a physician and an abolitionist. And though the school itself was only for women students, there were men on the faculty. And to get in, the students had to be at least 18. They had to have an approved certificate of good moral character, a good English education, and some other requirements. <laughs> well, as we know, a lot of there's a lot of moralizing happening in certain ways, too. <laughs> um, also around marriage when it came to women's medical training, like <laughs> it was a lot of <laughs> things about good matrimony and, you know, the ultimate goal of women <laughs> being being married. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> she started going to the New York Medical College for Women in 1867. And she and the other students who attended sometimes had to do clinical work. So sometimes she had to go to Bellevue Hospital and her school was all women students. But when she would go to this hospital, there would be male students there as well. And there's an article that talks about the hostility that those students were met with when they would go to this hospital. It said that the women were met with, quote, hisses, indecent language, paper balls, and other missiles. But she paid for her schooling on her own and through her job teaching in the public school system. And she ended up going to the medical college for three years. And this is where her first comes in. In 1870, she got her medical degree from the New York Medical College for Women. And she was nominated to be valedictorian. So she did well in her schooling. And that made her the first Black American woman to earn a medical degree in New York State. And the third to earn one in all of the United States. And then she began practicing medicine. She practiced in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and she specialized in prenatal care and childhood diseases. As we often see with women at the time, they, a lot of them focused on treating women and children. She had Black and white patients. And when it came to her personal life in 1871, she married William G. McKinney, who was a minister, and she married him. That wasn't long after she left school. He owned a home in Weeksville, and the two of them had two children together, Anna and William. And she went on to open a private practice in her home there in Weeksville and became known for treating malnutrition in children. And from here, her illustrious career in medicine continued in the early 1880s, she taught at the New York Medical College for Women. In the late 1880s, she did some post-grad work at the Long Island Medical College Hospital, where she was the only woman physician. And she was an organizer and co-founder of the Brooklyn Women's Homeopathic Hospital and Dispensary, which opened in 1881. She was a member of their staff until 1895. So she practiced in Brooklyn from around 1870 to 1895. And she was a member of the Kings County Medical Society and the New York State Homeopathic Medical Society. So she did have two husbands in her lifetime. In 1890, her husband had a stroke and was paralyzed. And a few years later, in 1894, her husband ended up dying. And Two years after that, she married Theophilus Gold Stewart, who was an army chaplain for the 25th United States Colored Infantry Regiment. She traveled across the country with him while he was preaching, and they also traveled outside of the U.S., and she was licensed and practiced medicine in places like Montana and Nebraska. And apparently, according to some sources, in 1897, she traveled from Ohio to Haiti to help deliver or witness the birth of her first grandson. So she was a resident physician and she taught health and nutrition 
at Wilberforce University in Ohio eventually. Um, Shortly after she began her work there in the late 1890s, her husband retired from the army and he also began teaching there. And she remained at Wilberforce until she died. Outside of her medical work, she was socially involved. She cared about education herself, missionary work, suffrage, and temperance, um, things that many women were involved in the day. Not saying that all, those are all issues that I ride for, but <laughs> she was definitely socially involved and seemed to be, she was a meeting point for some people. Like she was a leader in terms of the work that she was doing there in some ways. Like, for instance, she and her sister, Sarah Smith, held fundraisers for the Women's Loyal Union. So the Women's Loyal Union of New York and Brooklyn had this aim of uplifting Black women's social and political involvement. They were dedicated to causes like anti-lynching and suffrage. And for instance, there was one time that she held an art exhibit at her house to raise money for the union. So people seem to have looked to her to be a leader in these for these social causes as well. In 1911, she gave a presentation at the first Universal Race Congress at the University of London in England. And in 1914, she gave a speech about women in medicine at the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs Convention in Ohio. And this speech was about women in medicine across centuries. Um, It was about how women have made a name for themselves in medicine across the world and over time. And it's worth looking back at those. And she also said that women-only schools weren't necessary anymore and co-ed was the way to go for equal opportunity, which was something that, a sentiment that was circulating at the time once women started gaining more entry into women-only institutions. But yeah, so she died on March 7th, 1918, when she was 71 years old, and W.E.B. Du Bois gave the eulogy at her funeral. And in 1974, a junior high school in Brooklyn was named after her. So that was the summary of her life. She is, of course, after this point, many more women gained inter- into institutions and started becoming doctors. So it was kind of that transitional period. And she herself came after other women who like set the stage for her. So that is her story. Yeah, she once again, she did so much. I love how there's so many pieces of her story, like the organ playing, <laughs> the teaching and the, Having, recognizing the people in, before her, but also like making space for the people after her, which is something we talk about so much on here, of that importance of uh, paving the way for more people to come into the space. And also, yeah, W.E.B. <laughs> du Bois speaks at your funeral. That's pretty, yeah, that's something. <laughs> well, thank you, as always, Eves, for bringing these stories to us with so much care and so much nuance. Uh, we appreciate it every time. I'm happy to. And we're always we're always happy to have you mm-hmm. and we're happy to receive cards from you. <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> um, where can the good listeners find you? Y'all can find me on Instagram at not apologizing. You can also just go to my website, evesjeffcoat.com. That's spelled Y-V-E-S J-E-F-F C-O-A-T dot com. And you can find me on many, many other episodes of Stuff I've Never Told You for the Female First series, talking about other women in history from all over the world who had firsts. And you can find me on On Theme, a podcast co-hosted by me and Katie Mitchell, talking about Black storytelling in all its forms. Yes. Yes, go do that. Listeners, if you have not already, go subscribe. And listeners, if you would like to contact us, you can. You can email us at Stephanie at MomStuff at iHeartMedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at MomStuff Podcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff I'll Never Told You. We have a tea Public store. We have a book. You can get it wherever you get your books. Thanks, as always, to our super producer, Christina, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs>